ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the moderator, Terry Martin. Hello, hello, and, and welcome to Freedom's Fighters, uh, which is a marvelously provocative title, Freedom's Fighters, and we have a couple of them with us on the stage this afternoon, whom, well, still morning, I've been, I've been at this uh, since quite early, it seems like afternoon by now, but um, it's, it's really a wonderful session. We're looking at the brave men and women around the world who continue to stand up against tyranny under very difficult conditions, uh, as, you, as you know. We're also going to be looking at what governments, civil society, and the private sector could do to help these movements, these people who are standing up to tyranny, what they can do to help them deal with their situations and, uh, and achieve their goals, ultimately. Um, we'll see how far we get with that, but we have three people with us who can definitely provide insights from the inside of that battle. Uh, against tyranny. It's my great pleasure to introduce someone I've had the pleasure of speaking with several times over the past couple of years. Uh, this name will not be unfamiliar to you, Svetlana Tekhanovskaya. Please join us. Lobsang Sangai. And Jamie Fly. Thank you very much. My, my apologies to start off uh, that I'm going to have my backs to the people who are sitting behind me. This is uh, one of the disadvantages of sitting in, in the round, but uh, maybe I, I can turn around from time to time. Just be, please accept that I, I have, I'm aware that you're there and uh, I'm not ignoring you. Um, the way this session is going to unfold, we are going to have a, have a brief discussion here. We're going to have some introductory remarks from each of our, each of our panelists. Uh, then we will also have a little poll, we're going to create a sound cloud. Uh, this, this question for the sound cloud will be, uh, will be shown on the screen and, and you can use your GlobeSec sec app here in the room or at home if you're following this online to, uh, to give your input to the question. Uh, the question, by the way, uh, it is name the person you most admire of any age or culture who successfully challenged tyranny. Now this, uh, it, it's showing up on the wall right over there. Okay, um, I've got to get used to, to this uh, surround, uh, surround immersive experience with the technology. That's marvelous. I compliments to GlobeSec. Let's jump straight into it. Um, we know what, what we're dealing with here. Svetlana Tekhanovskaya, leader of the United Transitional Cabinet of Belarus. We have Lobsang Sangai, former president of the Central Tibetan Administration. Uh, and we also have Jamie Fly, who is the executive uh, president and chief executive officer of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. Now, this is not a completely symmetrical group we have here. Right? So we have Svetlana Tikhanovskaya uh, in exile, having faced uh, an election in Belarus, which many believe that you won that you are the rightful leader of Belarus. This is, this is assumed, this is only a couple of years ago, and we have a hot war right next to, to Belarus in Ukraine, uh, and with Russia being the aggressor, and Russia having now, uh, it's said, transferred tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus, uh, which many fear may be used in Ukraine. This is something that's happening right now. With Tibet, it's a slightly different situation. Uh, you've led a government in exile uh, for, for, for years. You continue to lobby for Tibet to be, I don't know, we will find out exactly what you're hoping to, to achieve. And Jamie Fly, uh, who is trying to provide information to and to provide a, a mindset for those who are indeed fighting ty tyranny, and you will share with us your ideas on that. I'd like to start with you, uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. Uh, maybe just update us on where your struggle stands today and uh, where you see it going. So thank you, everybody who came here to uh, hear about uh, Belarus uh, and our updates. I have to say that Belarus now is facing two main uh, problems. The first one is total tyranny uh, in Belarus. Uh, political uh, pressure 
uh, is continuing uh, in our country and the number of political prisoners is increasing every day. Every day, 10, 15 people are being detained in our country. Not only those who are supporting, uh, uh, who are supporting changes, but also those who are supporting the war. And the other issue is a uh, threat to independence uh, of Belarus. We see the signs of uh, creeping or hybrid occupation by Russia for our country, and we see uh, illegitimate Lukashenko, who piece by piece selling our uh, Belarus to uh, Kremlin. Uh, so the aim of the regime now is to split democratic forces to organize us and our task as democratic forces first to stay united to engage uh, Belarusian all Belarusian people inside the country outside country in the movement and to continue our fight for democratic changes so we uh, create structures uh, to uh, counter propaganda we have united transitional cabinet it's a unity of political forces uh, of belarus uh, we created coordination council that consists of uh, uh, ngos organizations just to uh, uh, stay united to form uh, public opinion uh, also we actively engage uh, free media to uh, shape people's mindset to show the truth about situation in belarus to show situation in ukraine and also we are working uh, uh, with the international uh, community, with international organizations. We want to institutionalize our relationship with uh, countries, with organizations, to show them that it's important to work, vitally important to work not with regime, with uh, those who commit tyranny inside the country, but with those who share your values, who fight for democratization of Belarus, and uh, of course, we face a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges in Belarus, a lot of challenges on the international arena, uh, but we are really together. We have a lot of friends uh, around, so uh, I believe in, uh, in uh, our victory one day. Sangai, where do things stand now with your struggle uh, for Tibet? Well, um, I saw the poll and the, uh, the name of Nelson Mandela as someone who succeeded uh, fighting against the tyranny. I hope the next in line will be Dalai Lama, along with you. you know. um, as far as Tibetans are concerned, if you uh, read Freedom House Index, uh, Tibet is li listed at the bottom along with Syria as one of the least free regions in the whole world. That speaks for itself, and the situation in Tibet has gone from bad to worse since Xi Jinping became president. Um, 157 Tibetans have committed self immolation burned themselves, and of which 133 have died. You know, so the protest inside, resentment inside, is continuing. Now, as far as my role you know, as the president or prime minister of Tibetan government exile for 10 years, the difference with Madam is that she gets to meet with all the presidents and prime ministers of Europe and America and Canada. As far as I'm concerned, I was never you know, accorded that kind of protocol. Uh, for 10 years, um, I could not you know, even enter the State Department or the White House. So speaking of America, it still is the biggest, loudest supporter of Tibet. Of course, I could meet with leaders in the Congress. Speaker Nancy Pelosi was a good friend, Marco Rubio and the senators and others. It took me 10 years to enter the State Department and the White House. How? Because we are talking about you know, resilience and persistence here. I lobbied. I used to go to Washington DC two or three times a year. Can you, in 10 years, I went there 30, 40 times, didn't get to enter the State Department White House. Finally, we passed a law, Tibetan Policy and Support Act. Now it's a law in America to support Tibet. And finally, I managed to enter the State Department in the White House. You know. When you so say if you persist, you mean the United States? Or? Uh, United States, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as Europe is concerned, yes, uh, has been a bit wishy-washy. Because I was, you know, as the Prime Minister from 2011 to 2020. From 2011 to 17, everybody wanted to engage with China, make money with China, and do business with China. So we, Tibet was seen as a nuisance, you know. Um, uh, now, climate has changed a bit, even in Europe, there's realization that China is uh, a threat as far as freedom, human rights, democracy is concerned. But still there's a divided Europe, you know, I have had some very disappointing experience with few foreign ministers of, you know, European countries, very rich, they didn't need Chinese money. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they reduced the protocol, even of visit of Dalai Lama to, let's say, Norway. 
Later, we found out that you know he was uh, an advisor to Chinese government's state council in some capacity. You know, so um, unfortunately, uh, the fight against tyranny continues. Um, there are voices around the world. There are activists and freedom fighters around the world. They need all the help from government, civil society, and this kind of forum helps you know magnify our voices. So thank you to Globsec and my friend Martin and others for organizing this. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Fly, you are on the cutting edge of trying to change uh, the regimes, let's say. Uh, would, would you say, is regime change one of your missions? Uh, we, we don't focus on uh, a mission of regime change. I mean, our mission is providing truthful reporting to audiences where they're being denied facts, um, usually by state-sponsored propaganda by a closing or closed political system like the one that Svetlana described in uh, Belarus where it's not just being a journalist or being a protester or political activist that can get you jail time right now in Belarus actually consuming truthful reporting can get you a prison sentence and we've had reports that some of our audience in Belarus have actually served jail time for visiting the act of visiting a website in 2022 2023 uh, that is the sort of authoritarian control we're talking about. And unfortunately, it's not just Belarus. We're seeing these trends across Eurasia, where RFERL operates in 23 countries and 27 languages. You see the landscape shifting. You see the situation getting worse in country after country. And when they see these tactics work uh, that are deployed by regimes like the Lukashenko regime, they're tempted to try to uh, similar methods to rein in their population and resist the efforts of citizens to take power into their own hands. My, my question, uh, I wasn't trying to be provocative in this, in this sense because it is kind of a loaded term regime change, I respect that. Uh, what I was more trying to get at, what, it, what is the purpose of your organization of Radio, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty? Uh, you provide this information, uh, accurate information as opposed to disinformation about what's going on in those societies and you try to make it accessible to the people there despite the obstacles that are put in their way. And what is, but, but to what end? What is the ultimate purpose, the strategic purpose of, of that? Well, I think we believe that uh, healthy, independent media is essential to democracy. I think in the West, in the EU, in the US, uh, at this point, uh, there's been a decline in trust in media. I think many of our citizens take for granted the role that the media plays in holding politicians accountable, being a check uh, on government power. Uh, and so, at least in the U.S., there's a, a strong view. This is why we've been funded for more than 70 years now and have supported the U.S. Congress across the political spectrum in the U.S. that our work is vital if we're serious about helping to foster democracy in countries that either don't have it or are struggling democracies that are on that uh, transition path. The sad thing I just note as well about the, the landscape we're looking at is we as a company have actually returned to three EU member states in the last five years. So this is again not just a situation we're facing in places like Belarus, Russia, uh, or Central Asia. Uh, this is a problem that's starting to hit home as well uh, in Western societies and I think we need to realize that and, and take uh, steps to reinforce uh, independent media. I just so everyone knows, I, I do work as a as a journalist myself. I'm I'm a broadcaster. I work for Germany's foreign broadcasting service Deutsche Welle, which broadcasts in 32 languages, also to some of the countries you were just describing, also with a mandate to provide uh, accurate information about what's going on uh, in the world and Can that contributes to, to to democracy. And I would just make one more point before I bring you in that um, yesterday we had a very interesting session where we where the focus was on disinformation and democracy and the relationship between information. A free free press and democracy is absolutely vital. I can only subscribe to that and feel I need to underline that as, as a journalist. Please look. It's talking about disinformation. For example, Chinese government television, CGTN, right? The English version has 100 and I think around 50 million subscribers around the world. Now, BBC, CNN, and Al Jazeera, English language combined, has less than 100 million. So CGT and Chinese la in English language, I'm not talking about in Chinese language, okay, there are 1.4 billion people. These are not the people. It's the English speaking people around the world subscribe to CGTN, 150, around 150 million subscribers. So it's far more 
than CNN, BBC, and Al Jazeera and other English language, you know, combined. So this is what we are confronting with. And if you look at Xinhua News Agency or People's Daily, the French version or the German version, I'm pretty sure, you know, they have more subscribers than DW and other, you know, friend. Uh, so that's why, you know, any uh, radio liberty is very important to, you know, engage so we can give not just, you know, uh, challenge disinformation, but the truth about Tibet. So as far as we are, because we are overwhelmed with that kind of uh, information. Information, uh, a free press, these are considered essential instruments for, for democracy, as, as we've just pointed out. But what effect is our efforts to provide that sort of information, the sort of accurate reporting within your, within China, within, within Belarus, what impact is that having? Do you feel that's having an impact? Is it, is it helping? Svetlana, take a look. You know, in uh, Belarus, all the alternative or free media have been ruined. And uh, all the media have been recognized by illegitimate regime as uh, extremists or terrorists. So most of uh, our uh, free media had to relocate to other countries and to broadcast from, uh, from exile. And uh, the Radio Free Europe was in Belarus as well. Your office was ruined. Uh, some of journalists are in prisons. Uh, but uh, of course, the meaning uh, of uh, free uh, media cannot be uh, underestimated, of course, because through uh, non conventional uh, media, we can spread messages inside Belarus. Because people in our country, if they watch Radio Free Europe or uh, other uh, Belarusian free media, they can be detained for this. And uh, we are using maybe non, uh, no, as I said, non-conventional methods, YouTube, TikTok, uh, Instagram, Telegram, all the means, you know, that people can uh, use uh, freely inside the country. We, can't, we don't have access to television, we don't have access to newspapers in our country, but uh, it's so important, you know, to support free media in such situation when uh, we uh, don't have, uh, you know, self supplies we we need assistance technical assistance from uh, from uh, other countries from powerful countries uh, inside Belarus uh, for those people who can't uh, use internet like elderly people or people in villages we have network of volunteers that uh, spread self made newspapers it's like old method of spread information, but we have to use this. And of course, what I'm advocating for is that uh, uh, media powerful companies uh, have uh, Belarusian departments in the, uh, in the entities, like uh, Radio Free Europe has Belarusian department, Deutsche Welle uh, opened uh, one, BBC, uh, uh, I don't know, other uh, media network also have to pay attention to this issue. We are simultaneously, we are working with Google to uh, counter propaganda together to highlight Belarusian uh, question to uh, I don't know, translate uh, programs in Belarusian language not to uh, not to broadcast in Russian because uh, one of our priorities is to strengthen uh, national identity to strengthen to strengthen Belarusian language and uh, uh, this is where uh, you know uh, free media international media can be useful as well. I think we can all agree that you know, f access to free and accurate information is essential for, for democracy and for people to be informed about what's going on in, their wor in the world and w how to hold their governments also to account for independent reporting on that. That's just one aspect, though. Uh, beyond that, what, what are governments doing? I mean, your organization is funded by the U.S. government, I believe, Jamie, Jamie Fly. Um, the, what, are, what do you expect from governments beyond media uh, providing some sort of uh, access to, to free and accurate information to do to help your causes to actually affect change? Because I mean, it's not going to be just through through media. I mean, we also I'd like to, for you to also bring in the private sector if you can. What they're doing. You mentioned Google supporting you mm -hmm. in, in in some way, but what? What can be done to actually affect change? And you're looking at this from very different perspectives. Um, Lob Sangai, your struggle has been going on for decades. Yes. And many. Yeah, 60 years old veteran, I think, this room, yeah. And, and many look at Tibet and say, 
this is a lost cause. I remember when I moved to Berlin 30 years ago, uh, there were free Tibet stickers and flags all over the city in the kind of alternative cultures. These have kind of slowly faded away. You don't see them much anymore. There's not much focus on it. Belarus is getting a lot of attention right now, but people look at Lukashenko and look at his alliance with Putin uh, and think, That's, you know, how can that be broken down? What can be done? Now, I think as far as uh, the question uh, of the panel was, about the mindset of the freedom fighters, right? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you know, it's persistence and perseverance and passion. It has to come from within. If you're a freedom fighter, if you rely on someone else, they will come and go. You know, it's like a roller coaster. I'm very happy that you know, Madam gets to meet in you know, all the head of states. But time will come again. We'll say Belarus is now you know out of headlines, and let's you know downgrade that meeting. So as 60 well, years, where do you draw that from? This passion and this this persistence in your case. Of course, my country Tibet is under occupation. Six million Tibetans are suffering. As a human being and as a Tibetan. I have no option but to express my solidarity. My father was a freedom fighter, has just passed on his legacy to me, and I have to pass on my legacy to my daughter and all the younger generation, right? And challenges are hu and, uh, huge, as you, asking, as you asked, what can governments do? For example, when it comes to media, Chinese government policy is very clear. Zero hundred policy, meaning zero information from outside on Tibet, and 100% information or propaganda to the outside world. That's why they have banned Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's why the CGTN Facebook accounts has 150 million subscribers, whereas they have banned in China. Now, why can't the European countries ask for reciprocity? You know, if you want to you know, have accounts in Facebook in the Western world, why don't you allow you know, Facebook to be accessible to Chinese people at Twitter and Instagram, right? It's reciprocity. You want to come in? Yes. You should allow us to come I inside China as well. They are using Facebook, and Facebook is allowing them to be used for CGTN. But Facebook doesn't say anything about Chinese people ha having access inside, you know? So these are the challenges where governments can do, civil society, ca civil society can do, and people can always, you know, get involved. So, J Jamie Fly, I want to bring you in because, uh, again, you, you, it's the, the, you, you represent to some degree uh, the United States' efforts to provide uh, free information, access to information outside. So, what is, is the government of the United States, when it, when it looks at R Belarus and it looks at the cause of Tibet, and you, what, what, is, what is the policy within, within the S State Department, say, uh, with trying to, to affect change there besides, say, supporting your organization. Is this, a, are these, is this a lost cause? Is Tibet a lost cause from the U.S. perspective? And, and what about Belarus? So I'll just be clear that I cannot speak on behalf of the U.S. government because actually I don't work for the U.S. government since we are independent, even though every year the U.S. Congress does fund us. Um, but our editorial independence is enshrined in U.S. law, and that's important, uh, you know, part of the equation, too, because... Of course. U.S. taxpayers, even though they fund us, are funding us because they support the type of work we do, not because they want to direct the type of coverage that we provide. And I think that goes, though, in the U.S. there's an understanding that this is a long-term effort. Uh, we have a 70-year history. For a number of the countries that we worked in where we don't work anymore, it was a decades-long struggle to provide news information despite authoritarian attempts to block our signals when we were mostly broadcasting in radio. Now the modern equivalent is uh, blocking internet, censoring what websites you can watch. Um, but throughout those decades, we had a committed audience, including in places like Slovakia, Czech Republic, where we're headquartered now in Prague. Uh, it was illegal for us to even operate or send a journalist to Prague 30 or 40 years ago. Now we have 700 staff working there after we were invited by Václav Havel because of his respect for our work. So you, you see that even after decades, things can change. People during those dark periods are still interested in seeking out the truth. And the stories that Svetlana uh, mentioned of citizens trying to find sources of information, we are seeing those in country after country, including in places like Russia, where three years ago you could go to our websites without any problem. Now they're blocked. You have to use a virtual private network. 
VPN downloads are at record highs in, in Russia right now. Yeah. People are seeking out alternative means of getting information because they don't trust the propaganda that they're getting from their regime, especially when global events, the uh, invasion, full-scale invasion of Ukraine affect people's lives. They want to know what is actually happening next door. They want to know what is truly going on on the front lines. They want to know why their own personal economic situation is affected. And we see again and again, just like the Czechs and Slovaks who had to turn the dial to find the frequency that was not being jammed that particular night, Russians today, Belarusians and others are using tools, using technology to come to us, to come to other independent sources. And right now I'll just note that our Russian audience uh, online is the highest ever, uh, despite the fact that our websites have been blocked ever since the start of the full-scale invasion. You can see through those actions of the audience that people are interested in this factual reporting and they're hungry for it. And so I think that gets to your uh, earlier question about impact. We have about uh, only 14 minutes left, I see there on the clock, and I do want to get some questions from the audience while we're here. Uh, I failed to mention, by the way, my, my apologies, that anyone who's following this online can also submit a question, and it will magically appear on this, on this little tablet in front of me. Uh, and then when we get towards the end, we'll take a, a look at the completed uh, Slido word cloud. But let's, maybe we can get that up on the screen right now just to see where our, where our word cloud has, uh, has come. Can we, can we put that on the screen? Uh, to see Harry, can I make one point? Sure. Because you mentioned Tibet as a lost cause twice. Yes. Yeah. I must say, because we are in It's an impression Europe. many people have. That's true, yes. You know, I've been to Central Europe, right? In Slovakia, you know, uh, and uh, Czech and other countries. Uh, in late 1980s, many of the people in Central Europe thought it was a lost cause. Soviet Union was so powerful. The Berlin Wall will never come down. You, we all mentioned, you know, here Nelson Mandela, Václav Havel, you know, uh, all the names were mentioned. Even Nelson, if you read the, uh, you know, history of Nelson Mandela, uh, he spent 27 years in prison, of which, you know, uh, 18 years in solitary confinement. Even news media, I, I, I'm not trying to blame you, but, you know, wrote an obituary over Nelson Mandela, he's, he's a lost cause, you know. Vaslev Havel was a lost cause, right? So, it's just a matter of time. And, and then we are Buddhists, we believe in reincarnation. Even if I die, I come back. You are never a lost cause. And then uh, we believe in karma. Karma kicks in good. I, was, I just uh, got a message from hell that Nels, the Mao Zedong is in hell now. He's not going to be released for 10,000 years, you know? So we believe in reincarnation, karma. So there's never a lost cause. You always have second shot. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a very important point indeed. Um, I want to open up the floor uh, to questions. I see a couple of hands already, and I, I'm going to have to turn around to see the, see the people behind me when, when there's questions. But I see two hands. I, I see this one went up very quickly, and then in the front row there. So we'll start with, uh, I believe it's uh, Peter. Peter Wilding. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. I would like to ask Svetlana a question, if, I, if you don't mind, um, particularly with the news, right or wrong, that um, Lukashenko is a little bit ill today. Um, since the revolt in 2020, it is critical to understand, is it not, that if Belarus saw even a even even half of the revolt that we saw in 2020, that would change the course of the war in Ukraine and, in fact, change the geopolitics of Central and Eastern Europe. So Belarus is absolutely critical in the fulcrum point of history right now. So my question really is quite simple. Everybody in Belarus must know this. Surely foreign governments are assisting those uh, who are in rebellion against Lukashenko. And I would like to know from the ground floor, and I'm sure everybody else would, why is Belarus still quiescent? Is it tyranny alone, or is it something else? Because if Belarus revolted, then the geopolitics of this continent would change automatically. You know, to understand Belarusians, uh, uh, people have to live under dictatorship for many, many years. <laughs> you know, sometimes when uh, I hear from politicians or diplomats why people don't uprise again, you know, if, we, if uh, again will be uh, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets, you know, you would change uh, um, uh, again, you know, you, you will use this opportunity. But just imagine, uh, imagine yourself on uh, the place of uh, every Belarus at the moment. You live in constant fear. 
every day you can be detained for no reasons, for donating 20 euros to Ukrainian army, uh, for uh, wearing long, uh, wrong color of socks, you know, for singing a Belarusian or Ukrainian song. So now people are under huge repression. But when this news about Lukashenko's illness appeared uh, in media, it galvanized discussion of Belarusian people. Do we have plan? What's our strategy? When we'll have to, to go to the streets, you know? And it's frightened Lukashenko. And he appeared for 15 minutes to show that, look, I'm here, you know, to, to stop these discussions. So I see the readiness of Belarusian people to use the moment of opportunity when it appears. And of course, I uh, want to uh, explain to our uh, political lies how Belarus is strategically important. That don't leave Belarus for one day later. Now we are dealing with Ukraine, what we are fully support, because Ukrainians now are fighting not for their lands, they are fighting for all the uh, uh, democracies in the world. But don't overlook Belarus, because the war cannot be over until Belarus is free. Belarusian people are ready to uh, fight, they are ready to, uh, you know, to get rid of the regime, but we can't do this alone. We need assistance of the whole democratic world. And now, when I uh, return to lost cause, you know, while people in any country who are fighting for democracy believe and fight, you know, no one, uh, politician in the uh, democratic world can say it's a lost cause because for them it's an uh, excuse why we are not doing anything, you know, why we stop uh, supporting, why we are stopping. Defeatist, yeah. Absolutely. And it can take ages, but we don't have to lose hope. I, I, I will tell you now a rather personal story. You know, I have um, a child with special needs. And I had to rehabilitate, uh, to rehabilitate him for 10 years. At the beginning of this, of this path, I didn't know what will be the outcome of rehabilitation. Uh, will I uh, be able to integrate my child you know, in, in the society? But I knew that every day I had to work with him, I have to study him, I have you know, to <laughs> not, no, not knowing if there is a light in the end of tunnel. But this, is this was my responsibility uh, for my child. So fight for democracy in Belarus is my responsibility for my country. So I can't stop and say, oh, it's a lost cause, you know. Thank you. I, I see both of you sitting so, side so by I, side. I, can I hand the microphone to my neighbor after I've asked a quick question? Okay, yeah, why don't, you, why don't we bundle those questions then? Is that good? And the, and we'll very good. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. Thank you, Terry, for moderating such a great session. It's good to see old friends, Jamie, Svetlana, uh, Lobsang. Just so we don't have to wait for our reincarnation, um, but, but seriously, the, the, the global freedom agenda perhaps needs uh, a big victory, a big push. Um, it is an optimistic scenario out of a terrible situation, but if Russia definitively loses in Ukraine, there is a scenario in which the Putin regime collapses. Now, it may not lead to a, a better alternative, but there is at least the hope for that. Svetlana, uh, to you, obviously directly affected by, uh, by what happens in Moscow, and Lobsang, if, uh, if, if the regime were to fall in Moscow, do you think that that gives you guys hope in Tibet? Uh, because this would have a quite significant effect on global autocracy uh, and potentially a knock-on effect in Beijing, which you could potentially benefit from. And Jamie, obviously, providing an overview, if you'd like to comment, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. That's already quite a bit. Maybe we will take your question right now, too, and just bundle uh, Thank you. Salome Samadishvili, Member of Parliament from Georgia. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Svetlana, for the fight that you are putting up because as the member of opposition in the country which is increasingly authoritarian, we know what does it mean to fight the regime and how difficult it is. And, um, uh, and to be honest, of course, for us in Georgia, it's very important what happens in Belarus because my country, unfortunately, is you know, kind of looking more and more uh, like this government is trying to take us closer to Lukashenko model rather than the European model. And I'm sorry that the Prime Minister of Georgia used the Globsec Forum this morning to announce basically the change of policy and declared that NATO is, seems to be no longer the choice of his government or joining the NATO. Uh, I have a question to you about the Western policies towards Lukashenko, because when I was Georgia's ambassador in Brussels, 
I remember for a long time there was this discussion that we should try to keep, you know, ties with Lukashenko. We, you know, if we push him harder, if we introduce sanctions, then he will really turn towards Russia. It's very much the discussion that I hear now about my own government that, you know, if we push these people harder, maybe they will actually change the foreign policy orientation. Do you think that the Western intervention earlier in terms of putting pressure on Lukashenko could have saved space in Belarus for democratic change? Because, of course, now what's happening is extremely discouraging because that's okay. how authoritarians work. They just crush protest and think that we all get tired and we just cannot continue and give up. Thank Do you, you think the West should have acted earlier? Thank you. So we've, we've collected a couple of ideas there. There's the question of, of what impact Russia losing in Ukraine might have on Belarus and perhaps also China and, by extension, Tibet. And we have uh, the question of whether pressure earlier on Belarus might have affected change. Look, I'm absolutely sure that uh, Ukrainians, with the assistance of uh, democratic world, uh, will win this war. And of course, at this moment, the uh, Kremlin will be uh, weakened, and hence Lukashenko will be weakened as well, and uh, dictators hopefully in other countries. And our task is to be ready for that moment. That's why we are building structures, we are institutionalizing our relationship with the organizations, with governments, you know, to have this uh, period of transition uh, smooth and fast. Uh, we. Um, we, we will have to feel this moment of, of opportunity to mobilize people inside the country, to mobilize civil society, those who are in exile, but also to mobilize our um, uh, political ally you know, for some actions. When, again, when Lukashenko uh, got ill and we discovered that uh, uh, democratic partners don't have clear strategy what to do in case Lukashenko disappears. We understand that it will be turbulence inside Belarus. There will be a competition maybe between some powers inside the country. Russian would, uh, the Russians would like to put somebody. What will be the response uh, from, from international society? That's the question. Uh, Go ahead. Um, the, you know, if uh, Ukrainians prevail, I think this is a fight or war of freedom versus dictator, right? So I think if Ukrainians win the war and manage to, you know, recoup, regain all their territory, it will be a historically, you know, historical catalyst moment like the Fall of Berlin Wall. The freedom prevails once again. The little guys prevail once again, right? So that will send a message to Asia, to China, saying, it, you know, sending a clear message that beware if you are thinking of, you know, invading or attacking. Uh, Taiwan. Now, not waiting for reincarnation, just in this life. Something unique is happening because in that you know, a panel, uh, our, uh, it's mentioned, Iran is mentioned. How did the protests in Iran happen? A minority Kurdish woman, right, Asa Amini, right, she wore hijab the wrong way, you know, they beat her up and died. That galvanized whole of Iranian women to come and support, led to the movement. Now, in China, because of zero COVID policy, right? A Uyghur woman, Abdul Rahman, dies with her four children. That galvanized Han Chinese all over China to come and protest against COVID policy, in zero COVID policy of the Chinese government. So, you know, a minority sparking a nationwide protest in China and in Iran speaks for itself that not just reincarnation, in this life itself, things are happening. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we only have a minute left, and I want to give Jamie Fly then the last word on, on this, uh, since we, I think we do need to leave the room promptly, uh, unfortunately. And there's clearly so much more to say on this subject, and we can learn so much from all of you. Jamie. I would just say to Robin's uh, hopeful and optimistic question about what things uh, need to be done after Ukrainian victory, I think the danger is a new complacency, because the war, even if it's won, uh, the war for democracy will not be won in places like Ukraine or Belarus, uh, as we've seen in Moldova and Georgia overnight. Even when, in the case of Moldova, you have a government that wants to push in the right direction, there's still capacity issues, there's corruption, uh, there's attacks on independent media and efforts by authorita external authoritarians to undermine, and we're going to see the same thing, I think, even 
after a Ukrainian victory on the battlefield. And so the resolve from the U.S. Uh, and the European democracies will, will still need to be there. I'm told we can take an extra two or three minutes. Uh, so I want to get the word cloud up on the screen for just a second to take a look at it before before we close. There we see uh, Nelson Mandela making a comeback. Yasser Arafat was uh, was the, the most dominant name there for a while, and it, it still is uh, at this point. But we see, uh, yeah, Vladimir, uh, Vladimir Zelensky there, Winston Churchill, Vac Vaclav Havel, uh, but Nelson Mandela, Yasser Arafat and uh, many others standing up, of course, and some of you as well, both of you mentioned there, of course, uh, Lop Sangai and Svetlana Tekhanovskaya. A final, final word from, uh, from the two of you regarding what your message of inspiration would be to other freedom fighters around the world, F freedoms fighters, as, they, as the title of this session is called, what your message would be to inspire them to continue over the long haul to achieve what we all agree could be very, very difficult. I think Chinese leader Mao Zedong said, wherever there is repression, there will be resentment and there will be revolt, right? So we are human beings, social you know, beings. We all are born free and we would like you know, f to die as a free person. So the freedom struggle, freedom movement and freedom fighters will dominate the world till end of tyranny and dictators. That's the way it is. That's what karma is all about. No, my my uh, message will be rather sim simple. Don't uh, lose hope and believe that uh, uh, your fight, uh, fight for uh, liberty, for freedom, for democracy will prevail. We have to share our uh, experience. We have to share tools and is instruments how to fight with uh, dictators. Uh, but again, um, fight for democracy is not a local one. We, Tibet and Belarusians, are fighting uh, for global values for values that we are all sharing. And we, it's a moral obligation of every powerful, small, big country, you know, to support those who are still overcoming uh, the challenges who are still on this path. We can't do uh, it alone. It's, uh, this fight is a global one. Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, Jamie Fly, and Lobsang Sangay, thank you, all of you and everyone here in our room for uh, participating in this. I, I, I hope we can continue this discussion again at some point and hope we've all learned something I certainly have. Thank you all. Thank you.